the Growing for Market podcast. The system has to help farmers make money. The farmers have to be economically viable. And the food that we pro- the farmers produce should be socially acceptable. Acceptability is not just in terms of like, you know, okay, this is food I can accept. It is about, can I afford, can I purchase this? The equity, food-related equity, affordability and accessibility, those are also very important. And with the AI, AI is has become very, uh, you know, more popular in the recent years, but the innovations, ag innovations and modern technologies have been integrated into IPM for a long time. So that's what we need to focus on, producing food that is safe for everybody and that is affordable for everybody and that makes farming a profitable enterprise for the farmers. So that's what IPM is about. Hello, and welcome to the Growing for Market podcast, where we talk about growing, marketing, and the business of growing vegetables and flowers for local markets like farmers markets, CSAs, farm stands, and local wholesaling. I'm Katie Kula, your host and a writer for Growing for Market magazine. For 32 years, the only magazine devoted solely to flower and vegetable market farmers. If you're enjoying the podcast, just wait till you see the magazine. Go to growingformarket.com for more. Also, if you could give us a follow and a rating, it really helps other like-minded people find the podcast. And now let's take a minute to hear from our sponsors. It's with their generous support that we can bring you the podcast for free. Today's episode of the Growing for Market podcast is brought to you by BCS America. On our farm, we've had our BCS two-wheel tractor for over a decade, and with no belts to slip, its all-gear-driven construction is still going strong. Though we originally got it for rototilling, we kept it even when we went mostly no-till because it can do so many other things around the farm. From snow blowing to making raised beds with a rotary plow, to chipping wood, it can do just about anything you might need on a farm with the right attachment. Need to shred a cover crop? A BCS flail mower will make quick work of even the most vigorous cover crop and chop it up so it breaks down quickly. Want to stir in compost or amendments without inverting soil layers? A power harrow turns your BCS into a precise tilting machine with depth control so you don't mix deeper than you want to. With so many attachments to choose from, it truly is the Swiss Army knife of farm implements. It's why, instead of saying two-wheel tractor, so many people just say BCS. Tractors and attachments are on sale through the end of the year. Visit bcsamerica.com to find sale pricing and your nearest dealer. I am so excited to welcome Bootstrap Farmer as a sponsor of the podcast. I've known them for a dozen years, and if anyone tells you nothing is made in the USA anymore, well, they're headquartered and warehoused in Paris, Texas. They make their own all-metal, all-inclusive greenhouse frames of steel made in the USA and fabricated in Texas, and their heavy-duty, reusable propagation and microgreens trays are Midwest-made. With a complete range of supplies, they have just about everything for propagation and growing, including heat mats, ground cover, frost blankets, silage tarps, irrigation, and trellising. Want to color code your seed starting flats? They've got heavy-duty trays that will last for years in a full range of colors. Great for keeping farm seedlings separate from retail or just for fun. And they have an experienced team of growers to support everything they sell. If you've heard of the NRCS High Tunnel Initiative providing grants for hoop houses but have been put off by the paperwork, Bootstrap Farmer has a guide that will walk you through the application process so you can get your hoop house funded this winter. For all that and more, check out Bootstrap Farmer at bootstrapfarmer.com. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm talking with Surendra Dara, an Oregon State University professor and director of NREC, the North Willamette Research and Extension Center. While Surendra has extensive experience with many areas of agriculture, I invited him to the podcast to primarily talk about integrated pest management fundamentals and his research to continue evolving IPM methods. Dr. Surendra Dara is an entomologist with more than 25 years of experience in IPM and microbial control. Before moving to Oregon, he was based in California, where he worked with strawberry and vegetable growers. Throughout his career, he worked on numerous invasive and endemic species of arthropods and plant pathogens. He developed a strong research and extension program working on irrigation, nutrient management, 
pest and disease issues, biostimulants, and biological soil amendments to develop sustainable agricultural solutions. His research and extension covered commodities such as alfalfa, cassava, cotton, small fruits, and vegetables, serving agricultural communities locally, regionally, and internationally. Surendra has authored, co-authored more than 400 scientific and extension articles, which include three co-edited books, four co-edited special issues of journals, 25 book chapters, and more than 50 peer-reviewed journal articles. Whew. Uh, is a lot of writing. He has extensive international outreach experience training farmers in Bangladesh, Guatemala, Haiti, Kosovo, Moldova, Mozambique, Myanmar, and Zimbabwe. Sarenja, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to speak with you and super grateful that you are willing to share your experience and knowledge with our audience of market farmers. So thank you for fitting this into your day. Thank you very much, Katie, for the introduction and having me on this podcast. It is my pleasure to be a part of this. Great. Okay. So first of all, I always like to start at the beginning. Obviously, you are now a very experienced academic and professional with a passion for all things farming, but I'm curious about how you got to where you are today. What originally drew you to studying farming and why did you decide to approach it from the scientific and academic angle, especially the approach of entomology? When I got into agricultural sciences for my undergrad degree, I realized right from the beginning that entomology seemed to be very interesting because it is about animals and a lot of things related to insects is also related to humans, whether it is morphological issues, physiology and everything else. It is an animal and we are an animal, so you can see a lot of things similar in terms of the physiology and toxicological aspects and neurological things and everything else. So that's what actually got me interested in entomology. But eventually I realized that the pests being a big issue throughout the world for crops, along with weeds or pathogens. So my interest in entomology justified, you know, studying an important area of agriculture. And that's how I got into entomology and doing further studies there. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it that way, that thinking about entomology and insects as being animals, that does bring a whole another dimension into the farming puzzle that it's beyond plants, right? I mean, we can study horticulture and botany, but whether we want to or not, they're also going to be animals besides humans in our fields. (laughs) That's right. Insects, pathogens, beneficial and harmful ones. And it it is a very dynamic and evolving world. So it's a very interesting area of study. Yes, for sure. So you've been working to help support growers and farmers with managing pests on their farms for decades now. Can you tell us more about the types of farms you've worked with, the scale, types of growing methods? How often in all this work do you actually get to visit farms and work directly on the ground with them? Definitely. I can start with my first job in West Africa. I was hired by the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture in Benin, Republic of Benin in West Africa for controlling a pest with microbial control agent, a fungus. So that was my first job working with farmers, looking at their issue. The problem and the solution were already identified, but my job was to release this microbial control agent that actually cannot grow in vitro. You can't grow the pathogen on an artificial medium. So it was very challenging to grow the fungus that was imported from South America to grow in mites and release those mites in pest populations so that the fungus established the mites die on the plant and release the spores and can infect pest mites. So that was my first job. And that pathogen has spread in West African countries now. This was from 1996 to 99, and it was a three-year project. I was there doing this research and developing this technique of releasing infected mites, which are still alive, so that they can spread in pest populations, die, spread the disease, and then control the problem. So 
I heard that the pathogen has established in many countries in the West Africa in mites that infest cassava. Cassava is a staple carbohydrate source. Mm-hmm. So that was my first job. And afterwards, I worked in on many crops in many areas. And it is mostly responding to the growers' needs. What, what, what are the needs they have? And is it a particular pest problem or is it an anticipated problem too? It's not always reacting to the needs of the growers. Our job is also anticipate what might come in two years or five years or 10 years down the road. So we use our knowledge and experience to both help farmers both reactively and proactively. Since I'm a a farmer by background and not as experienced with some of the more theoretical parts of pest control, I wanted to make sure I understood what you were doing. So you were introducing a fungus that is a pathogen for a particular mite that is a pest in the cassava. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So is that an example of what would be called a biological control? Yes, it is actually within biological control. It is another sub area called microbial control. You know, biological control can include any of the biological organisms. It can be mites, predatory mites or predatory or parasitic insects or microbes. So microbial control refers to bacteria, fungi, viruses, and you know, entomopathogenic nematodes, using them to control pest uh, arthropods. Okay. So, and then that would be the mites in this case that you were trying to control. That would be the fungus to control mites. Okay. And you said that, so you were introducing it in the hope that that fungus would even stay in the environment and eventually do the work itself. Not It's not something that you would hopefully end up having to reintroduce to a f- particular field every year. It would be in the region and help many farmers. Exactly. That's the case here. There are two approaches in biocontrol or microbial control. One is you know, when you have an invasive pest, you go to the native country and look for a natural enemy whether it is a, an insect or an arthropod or a fungus or a virus, you go and look for a natural enemy, introduce in its new area, uh, you know, new home where it has, where it is causing problems. After verifying that it is safe in its new area, it is not going to cause any harm to into populations and all that. So that usually you release, introduce, and then a few times, and then it establishes and provides natural suppression. That's called classical biological control. And in this case, in my case, it is classical microbial control. The other one is augmentative control where you have, it it could be very much like native natural enemies. You periodically release them. So you augment natural populations by periodical release, which we usually see in many cases like especially in greenhouse production, when we release these uh, predatory insects or mites, that is augmentative control. And you can do the same thing with pathogens as well. They're available as microbial pesticides. They can be applied periodically like pesticide applications. So this is a different part, augmentative control. The one I worked on is the classical microbial control. Okay, so that's what you were doing in Africa at that time. And it sounds like you have traveled all over the world doing work like this and then eventually ended up in California. So at that point, what kinds of farms were you working to support there? What kind of scale, growing methods, primary crops were you working with a lot there? Yes, when I moved to California, it was uh, initially looking after strawberry and vegetable farms on the central coast. So they were all sizes. There were farms that were 25 to 30 acres. So that was a you know, kind of small farms. And then there are farmers with producing 10,000 to 25,000 acres, but you know, not in just one area. But these farms can be 300 or 400 acres of contiguous farm or, you know, or may they may they might have had a few hundred acres here and a few hundred acres somewhere. So they're all sizes and there are all kinds of farms. But initially it was a strawberry and vegetable farms. But afterwards, I had the responsibility to look after other small fruits like grapes, raspberries and blackberries as well. 
And now you are at NREC, which is not too far from my farm. I can't remember whether I already said that. And what is your daily work look like now? It seems like you've shifted a little bit gears in terms of not maybe doing as much on the ground research. That is correct. I took this position as the director of North Willamette Research and Extension Center. So my responsibility is primarily administration and a little bit of extension. My routine changes from day to day, as you can imagine, but it is typically looking after our people and looking after the place and most importantly, promoting the programs of our faculty and also Uh, public and uh, stakeholder engagement and working with colleagues on campus and other locations and so on. So it it is a a very dynamic environment. A lot of my job is taking care of the place and mainly like public relations kind of job, among other responsibilities. Like coming on a podcast, for example. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Okay, okay. And I just want to add that to us, you know, our station is the most diverse and uh, programmatically the most diverse and very important stations in the state. And being close to the Portland metro area also attracts a lot of people. In addition to the people or the stakeholders that attend our extension events, the extension events like field days and workshops and indoor meetings that our faculty organize, In addition to those, we have a lot of visitors. People from Oregon or Pacific Northwest or other states in the U.S. are also from other countries. They come to tour our facility. They just, some some groups just come to visit what, what is happening. And some of them are part of organized tours to showcase what Oregon agriculture is like, Oregon agricultural research is like. To give you an example, since March of 2023, so far we had, nearly 1,000 people Wow! that visited. These are general public or ag professionals from other states and all kinds of people. We had events for children. We had public outreach events and so on. So these take up a significant amount of my time. And I also go out to meetings organized by others to present about our program. For example, just last week, I was at a Rotary Club meeting giving a talk about NREC, NREC programs, and what each and everyone means and how they contribute to the local economy and agriculture. Yeah, it's a thriving place. And now let's take a minute to hear from our sponsors. It's with their generous support that we can bring you the podcast for free. Every fall on our farm, we order a couple sling bags of Fort V potting soil from Vermont Compost. Over the years, we've tried a lot of the compost and potting soil options out there, from making our own to buying off the shelf. And we keep coming back to Vermont Compost, both for overall quality and batch-to-batch consistency. It's that consistency that keeps us coming back. There are so many variables that affect how good your seedlings are. We know Vermont Compost will give our plants the best possible foundation, so we can stick to worrying about all the other stuff and not the potting soil. With Vermont Compost Company's pre-buy program, you can receive 15% off on orders placed, paid for, and shipped by December 21st. Listeners of the Growing for Market podcast will receive an additional 5%, bringing the total discount to 20%. Visit vermontcompost.com slash GFM for more details or mention this podcast when you place your order. And now back to the show. With all that work, do you ever get to just go and hang out or help with work in the fields and the plots you have right on the property there? Or, I mean, it sounds like you're at least out there if there's visitors sometimes. It is true. Like with the visitors, I do take them as I take them around the uh, center. I I frequently see the plots. But in addition to that, I also walk around and interact with our people, whether it is the staff or faculty doing experiments or doing things in their plots. We can't do everything remotely, right? Like we can do certain things remotely from your office, but unless you get out and get dirty, you really don't understand what soil means, what plants do, what insects and pathogens. So it has always been my passion and my style of operation. I I get out very frequently, even when nobody calls. Uh, When I was in California, even when there were no calls from the farmers to visit their fields, I allocated some 
days or parts of my days just to drive around, go and visit fields just to see what plants look like at different sizes of, uh, you know, at the different stages of their development and what insects look like and what their feeding is like. A lot of my research was based on those kinds of observations and, you know, getting inspired by what happens around rather than just depending on growers' requests. Yeah, that makes sense. So then when you did get a call, there it wasn't necessarily a big shock what they were saying. It sounds like you probably were already observing some of those growth trends, both in the crops and the kinds of pests that might be taking home in them, like a farmer field walk, but on a much, much bigger scale. That's right. (laughs) A whole region. (laughs) Yes. Okay. I could talk all day. I love talking to people about their work, but we should get into this practical stuff of pest management because that's definitely what I know our listeners want to hear too. So as background on our farm, obviously there's no farm that doesn't have to think about pests and how to prevent them, get it, yeah, avoid them, all of that. So I'd say our farm's pest management strategies were often done in really big, broad strokes. We never had a ton of employees. When we were big, it was still relatively small. I mean, maybe 20 acres of vegetables max. So we would try to use strategies that we knew to be successful, but they were like big things. So big picture items. So for example, we've always used a lot of row cover to exclude insects on crops that we knew were going to be targeted by things like flea beetles. That was always very effective for us, especially in the spring. We also had an organic sense of useful planting timing. So again, that's something we could do just like as part of our season. And we always found a really good success in planting insectary crops near certain key crops. For example, a big one for us were Brussels sprouts and aphids. We found that if we planted calendula and alyssum and phacelia before we planted the Brussels sprouts in the area we were going to plant them, we would cut our aphid count down dramatically, right? But but <laughs> so we were thinking about it. But then also mid-season, I bet a lot of farmers can relate to this. We would also find ourselves just moving really fast right? We had way too much to do every day. We could see that something was happening, but it didn't necessarily mean we had the time or mental space to always address it. So we definitely had losses or damage. And, you know, when you're dealing directly with the customer, there's a certain amount of grace in that whole system. But I'm very curious as a farmer to learn more about different systems that we could use. So all that to say, I'd love to hear more about integrated pest management. So IPM, let's talk about what it is, why farmers should care about it and learn more. Can we start with just kind of a summary of what that phrase means and for people who might not be familiar with it? Definitely. That's a great introduction to the question, what you said. As the name suggests, integrated pest management is managing pests by integrating various control options, right? And you mentioned three integrated pest management options that you already used, whether... I don't even know. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Whether growers realize or not, almost everyone uses integrated pest management. They just don't realize that those approaches are part of that. Uh, You mentioned three things. One, row covers. That is mechanical control. You you are excluding pests. And another one is insect tree plants. That's uh, conservation. You, You are providing plants to promote biological control. Another one is, you said, like uh, changing the dates or just changing uh, planting and certain things. That's part of cultural control. So you use already used three approaches there. And depending on the crop, pest, and the season, various other factors, you might be able to add other control options. There is mating disruption. There is application of botanical and microbial pesticides. Then there is also application of synthetic materials. If you are an organic farmer, you obviously don't use that, but you know that's another option. So you you can see there is biological control, cultural control, and mechanical control, three important things. And if you applied any biological pesticides or bio bio pesticides, then that there is that uh, approach too. So integrated pest management is trying is the approach that tries to take advantage of every option. And it, it is not just about one thing. It's always people only think pest management. When you talk about pest management, the first thing that comes to many people's mind is pesticides. 
Pesticides are only a part of the big picture. You could be using sticky traps or you could be using mating disruption. You release or you know apply pheromones that disrupt the mating of the certain insects. And you could be using these uh, trap crops or you could be, uh, like you said, you could be using netting or row covers that exclude them. So there, there is a huge list of cultural practices, change, change you know, like rows, row spacing or plant spacing and planting time and harvesting time. Minor changes in some of these can significantly reduce pest populations or, you know, either they avoid the critical incidence or infestation time, or they actually reduce even infestation based on some other manipulations. So integrated pest management, again, is integrating all available tools. That's what has been traditionally the approach. Apply synthetic pesticides or pesticides only when it is needed. Use all approaches first and apply synthetic pesticides or pesticides when it really necessary, is necessary. But it doesn't always work like that, right? Like, you know, there, they, when, when there are some chronic issues, you may have to do certain things even before planting. Crop rotation is one of those approaches. It is part of the cultural control. Crop rotation is you are trying to rot- rotate a susceptible crop with a non-susceptible crop of a pest or a disease so that the incidence or infestation is reduced. Sometimes growers fumigate. Sometimes they use fungicide or pesticide treated seed. We, here we are talking about conventional farms too, but even for organic farming, there are some options. They have. I've seen those starting to show up in the catalogs. Yes. So when we say that pesticides are to be applied only when it is necessary, it doesn't, it no longer makes sense because you are using even before the pest is there, right? Like you, you're doing it preventively. So that is why we needed to kind of update the IPM approach and then, you know, have the new approach representative of what is happening in the world. So do you think it would be accurate then to say that IPM, integrated pest management, is a term that has been useful on the extension side in talking about how to support farmers with thinking about all these strategies. It's not, it's what I'm hearing is that the farmer themselves, it might not be the language that first comes to their mind. They're just thinking, what are all the different ways I can prevent or control pests? And on the extension side, this is really useful language to say, hey folks, when we go out to a farm, we need to have a huge toolbox to talk with people so that we're not, first of all, it sounds like a big part of IPM is prevention, right? That's true. Okay. So extending that toolbox and building it and continually refining it so that as people who professionally support farmers, you have as many options as possible that they can use at all the different stages of their farming, which then of course, farmers can access themselves too. Is that an accurate way to sort of think about it? That is true. That is true. But I just wanted to add that it is not just the extension, but it is also the research and extension community. Both work on integrated pest management. Like you said, farmers, yeah, like you said, farmers may not know that they're already using IPM, but several are already doing that. Right. So I like thinking about this as having as big of a toolbox as possible with thinking about these these challenges on our farms. That helps me think about it. That's right. Because not all tools in the box are applicable to every issue, right? So having the toolbox and using what makes sense for that particular season or the pest or comp, you know, a, a complex of pests is important here. We just always can't say, spray this or do this or do that. We I always like to offer, hey, these are the tools we have, various options, and these are the best practices to use each tool by itself or with other ones. And you make the decision what works best, you know, based on what works best for your situation. So that's always, that's a better way of transferring knowledge rather than just saying this is the solution because those solutions can keep changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously things change even from season to season on the same farm, which can be maddening. (laughs) Yeah, right. And at one point, I mean, historically, there was probably an era where 
both in the farming community and in the extension and research community, the, the typical answer to a pest problem was here, spray this thing. Right. That's right. So, and we've learned over more recent decades that we can be a lot more nuanced. And then that not only benefits the greater environment we live in by reducing the number of chemicals introduced, but also, I mean, a lot of those chemical solutions didn't necessarily work in the long run because of if there's more suitable preventative measures that can also contribute to the overall sustainability and the health of things like the soil, that is at the end of the day better for the farm as well. That's right. Right? Yes. Yeah. So th this is where I would like to bring that human comparison usually, you know, when for, for us to have a healthy lifestyle, it, it depends on physical activity and our diet and then discipline and various factors. You know, it, it is partly influenced by our genetics, but it is also about our habits, what we do day to day and our work or stress and then, you know, all other factors that influence. So same thing for plants too. You, you, you have to start with resistant varieties, cultivars that can resist naturally or through the breeding program. There are several varieties that can resist pests and diseases. Then, uh, you know, these cultural practices are like uh, healthy habits and, you know, you provide right nurturing environment, good soil and optimal water, nutrients and everything is like, you know, having a good house with, uh, you know, love and caring, that kind of thing. And our education, that's, that's also kind of the knowledge of the grower and the role of teachers. These are extension educators and researchers working together to give knowledge to the children. And then, you know, they become better citizens and so on. So, and, and then the healthcare system and how it helps us when we get sick. Sometimes we do need to take some, go through some harsher treatments. Same thing. Right. If, if there is a serious pest. If you need a fumigation or application of a kind of dangerous pesticide, but the dangerous here means it should be used carefully only at the target in insect or pathogen in an appropriate way, just like uh, chemotherapy or radiation kind of things. So it is looking at all these things, not just various pest management options, but how you use them, when you use them. What kind of other factors uh, are influenced and what is the role of research and education and what is the role of communication, just like our doctor communicates with us, but, you know, all those things, part of integrated pest management here. I like those extended metaphors. When we, over the years, have had visitors to our farm, we often have home gardeners ask us about pests. And I someday maybe I'll, we'll leave the farm and I'll have a home garden and I'll know what it's like to home garden. But I always look at them and go, I don't really know, you know, <laughs> because all I've ever done is grow vegetables on a pretty big scale. Mm -hmm. But I often will say that we do feel like there's a certain amount where we as farmers are doing what we can to boost our plants. I'm going to put air quotes here, immune systems, you know, as if we're providing them appropriate fertility, like you said, appropriate water, healthy soil, we have an insectary planting nearby. So that we're fostering some of those good predatory insects on our farm. We've actually watched, for example, kale plants that initially we could see there's flea beetle pressure on them kind of outgrow the flea beetles. If it's a healthy plant, it's like there's a little tussle at the beginning and then the kale kind of wins. It's very, I'm sure that I'm using all sorts of weird language that's not scientifically accurate, but from our standpoint as farmers, it feels and it, uh, we observe that if we are doing our part, and that's not true in every case, some of that depends on weather, especially with flea beetles, if it gets real hot, that can be a challenge. But yeah, thinking about all those other pieces. So it goes beyond just the row cover, et cetera, and exclusion. It's also about just making sure our plants are as healthy as possible. That's right. And so I love how that also fits in with that metaphor you were using of the human body too. Yes. So here, what you said is like the, you know, building the immune system. Plants might initially suffer, but they have that environment. That, that builds their immunity or then power to resist the pest damage and then they, you know, overgrow or overcome the infestation. It's always fascinating to watch. And sometimes, like you were saying, how things change all the time, just different seasons, the same approach will work. And 
Other seasons, like I said, if it gets really hot out here, that can be a real, real challenge, especially for the brassicas. But yeah, many moving parts with this. So what kind of farmers do you think would benefit from learning more about IPM and to use some of the other language we've been using to learn more about this toolbox, right? And how might they start to use it on their farms in different ways if they're not already thinking about it in these ways? Well, IPM is like a fundamental approach. So it applies to all farmers, all whether it is a small farm or big farm, or it, it can be ornamentals or food crops or any, anything, landscape plants or anything, or indoor agriculture or open field uh, production. Integrated pest management is uh, like a universal approach that uh, applies to every kind of system. Okay. So all of us is what you're saying. <laughs> That's right. All of us. And and usually, if I can anticipate the next question, you might wonder, is it applicable to organic farms too? Usually that's what people ask. Yeah. Yeah. Let's ask that, right? Yeah. I think a lot of people do associate the phrase with IPM. It's like, oh, well, what do I need to do before I can spray the chemical? I think is how, is how a lot of organic growers that's right. think of IPM. But what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is it's that's maybe not an accurate assessment of the work. That's right. It is for every production system, whether it is a regenerative or conventional production or organic or any other kind of system we have. Uh, because if, even if you eliminate the pesticide applications from the whole picture, there are all other things, all other options and the principles and the communication and research and outreach and figuring out everything else is... Uh, common in all systems. So IPM is universal. Okay, good. That's what I was hearing you say earlier, but it's good to clarify that because I do think there is an idea out there, especially with people who are certified organic, that that's somehow different. And I think some of that's just because of who's used the language over the years. So I wouldn't necessarily years ago have thought if I saw an article about IPM that it applied to me as an organic grower. So it's good to know that that is not accurate. Okay. Hey, listeners out there, there's a funny shift. You're probably going to hear in my voice. I just had a weird internet thing happen at my house and Sandra was very patient and I fixed it, but I'm in a space now that you might recognize as the echo of a pole barn. So <laughs> we'll do our best, but Sandra will still sound great and we will keep learning about IPM. Okay. Let me get back to the question I was asking before. Before you got into your current administrative position, which I think is relatively new to you, you were actively doing research on IPM and techniques. So can you tell us what does that research look like? So if we're thinking about IPM as building this toolbox of strategies, what exactly are you doing in the research and where do you see IPM continuing to go for farmers? So in, in my previous job, it was uh, evaluating a lot of products and technologies and trying to figure out a way to integrate them as a part of IPM. Although I am an entomologist, my previous job had the general responsibility of looking after everything related to crop production and crop protection. So I was exploring the use of micro sprinklers to reduce water use in strawberries and integrate them to see what is the impact of micro sprinklers on the beds on spider mite populations. When you have micro sprinklers and they periodically mist water, they can reduce pest populations, mite populations. So looking at those things, like beyond what is the intended purpose of anything. Uh, similarly, I was also looking at several biostimulants. They, these are microbial or botanical or seaweed products and a combination of multiple things. So what is the impact on overall plant health yields? And also if they have an indirect impact, I wasn't measuring how exactly it happens in the plant because these are large field studies, but I was looking at the effect of these products or technologies on whether it is a powdery mildew or botrytis fruit rot or ligus bugs or you know some pest populations of general health so this is what i was looking at similarly i was doing a lot of studies on disease management and and essentially major pests in strawberries these are spider mites and western tarnished plant bug so looking at various products and how you 
mix and rotate them and have had had more strategies to increase their efficacy. And because my interest is in microbial control, I was trying to incorporate those biological pesticides and beneficial fungi-based products in, in all kinds of experiments I was doing. So I was looking at the impact of, for example, if there is a, an entomopathogenic fungus that is used for controlling a pest, I was since these fungi, as they evolved, they just don't have a relationship with the insect or an uh, arthropod, mite only. They have to survive on the plant in the soil. These are soil-borne pathogens or you know beneficial microbes. So they do have set one, you know various kinds of interactions with the soil, with the plant, and everything else around them. In this process, I found out that entomopathogenic fungi, these fungi that kill, infect, and kill arthropods can antagonize disease-causing organisms. So they can antagonize plant pathogens and they Hmm. also act like mycorrhizae because they form a relationship with the plant roots so they can increase the water and nutrient absorption and kind of impart uh, drought tolerance. Then they also promote the plant growth because they transfer nitrogen from dead insects into plants. That's not my study. It was someone else uh, studied. So as you can see, they, they kind of in build the immune system of the plant, not just kill insects or pests, but they also help plants grow better uh, by antagonizing uh, pathogens, triggering their immune system to resist various biotic and abiotic stresses. So this is kind of finding new ways. So as I said earlier, it is not just reactive, but being proactive too. So the job is to control a pest and there are certain products and options to control, but how can I increase the use of these beneficial microbes? They're generally, these products are generally expensive. They have short uh, shelf life and you know so there are some challenges. But when you see these additional benefits, growers might tend to use them because as they're controlling the target pests, the plant is also staying healthy. So that's finding out ways to promote sustainable production or sustainable pest management. So my research was looking at everything, like all economic (laughs) and plant production aspects, conducting a lot of field studies and some lab studies and some greenhouse studies, basically getting involved into agriculture, growing plants, and how do we improve? It is not just one area. Like, how do we increase the bottom line for the growers? Like, what what can they do by reducing the inputs, increasing returns, and increasing sustainability by uh, having fewer, like, applying fewer synthetic or uh, natural materials that, that, you know, that could potentially harm the environment. So all aspects. Okay. So all the things. (laughs) All the things. Yeah. I'm curious as you, with your knowledge of being sort of on the cutting edge of what is going on in IPM and pest management in general, what kind of strategies that are still in progress are really exciting to you right now? What does the future look like to you? That is actually a very interesting question. Research wise, there is so much going on in every area. Whether you are developing new varieties and then, you know, uh, are developing new products or monitoring technologies and up delivery mechanisms or everything, there is so much research that goes into everything. But what excites me is the opportunity to educate growers and then integrate all of them. A lot of times we are seeing, okay, I, like I said, if I use the sprinklers, micro sprinklers instead of overhead sprinklers, I reduce water. That's the Uh, basic idea. If you just do the research and show, yeah, there is a significant reduction in water, that's only one part of it. But what is the impact of reducing water or spraying? Is it increasing diseases because there is more moisture or is it reducing spider mites because moisture kind of, you know, is not favorable to them? Or what happens in the microclimate? These are all different kinds of interactions whether we apply a fertilizer, whether we apply any, anything, like if whether you have a row cover or insect tree plant, everything has an impact on something else. Yeah. So look, looking at those interactions is what excites me. Like it's not just a, you know, 
point A to point B, but what happens around those two points? And because, because it is a dynamic system, like we have been talking, soil is a an entirely different world. I'm, I'm very happy to see the shift on soil health and soil management in the past several years, because if soil is healthy, it takes care, it is like building the immune system for the plant. So it takes care of a lot of issues. So that's, that is the part that excites me and studying. I mean, I may not be doing research anymore, but you know, still there is a lot of learning, uh, learning from others' research and putting together pieces of various research into one thing. That's what excites me. And they, there is a, a st- still a lot for all of us to do. Integrating various studies is very expensive, as you can see. Like, you know, you, you know a lot of grants and a lot of projects are very directed towards a particular problem. And, uh, you know, they look at a particular approach. But when uh, uh, several researchers come together for this collaborative research, they're also expanding these impacts with the grant proposals, like a proposal request for proposals that are coming out and the proposals that are being submitted by researchers. It shows that this interdisciplinary approach is gaining a lot more popularity because everything impacts something else. So that's, that, that continues to excite all of us. And growers have a lot to learn from these. So, you know, again, extension has to play a critical role as researchers are studying these, developing knowledge. Extension has to disseminate this information to growers and not just disseminating, like help them figure out how best you can use this information. So there is plenty that happens and there is a lot more work for all of us. Yeah. What are your thoughts about the best methods for communication? I've always found, again, that I think back to especially our biggest years of farming and mid-season feeling so stretched thin that the thought of even reaching out to an extension agent felt overwhelming. So I don't know for farmers who are trying to access this knowledge Where do they begin? I mean, I guess as a farmer, I would probably say start making these connections in the winter with your local extension agent. But what are some of the tools that both farmers can be using? But how are you thinking on the extension side to actually transfer this knowledge in a way that's really useful to the busy farmer? There is no single tool to say this this is the best way to communicate because communication is a continuous process and we get bits and pieces of information. Sometimes it is a large chunk, like a scientific paper. Sometimes it is a short article. Sometimes it is just a simple phone call or you know a direct conversation. Or it could be a tweet or it could be some a small sentence about a you know a, a, a post on social media. So in, in my opinion, we need to look at everything. Like we have to use all communication tools, visiting farmers and having a direct con- conversation with the grower or attending workshops and meetings and listening to podcasts and webinars and reading articles, whether it is a newsletter article or a small blog or, or a detailed scientific article or a book chapter. You know, you know the information comes in all forms and all sizes. So the best way... For us is to keep accumulating this knowledge, but invest enough time to use it. A lot of times we read and we have an inform- some information, but we also need to figure out how we can use it for our particular form, particular pest, because a lot of these strategies can be applied to various crops and pests. So we don't need to just use that knowledge for a particular problem. We can adapt to other ones too. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, as we think about the future of pest management, what role in particular do you see technology playing? And I mean, right now, the big buzz concept, of course, is AI. And I I, I assume at some point there will be a role for AI too. And then also, I'm curious, I mean, I think this is going to be really important for our audience. How accessible do you think that technology is going to be for smaller farms? So what's coming and how do we make that, that work for even the small guys? It depends on which technology we are talking about. If it is putting a few sensors in, in the field, in the soil, or having you know aerial monitoring or certain things, uh, it might be possible with whether it is a small farm or large farm. But it all depends on that. If we are talking about a, a a big machine that has a precision planting or weed control, those are not possible for everybody right. because they are very expensive. So there is already a lot of technology 
uh, that small farmers can use as well. Okay. Whether it is for decision making or help with the decision to understand a particular problem and figure out, have you, you know, make your own decision. Uh, a lot of tools are already available. It, it is a continuously evolving technology. And if you go to some conferences and some ag related fairs, there are too many tools. It, it can be overwhelming. Yeah, uh, right? Like, definitely. Just like everywhere else, which one is good? Uh-huh. <laughs> what do I sure. actually? Because if everything seems interesting and everyone claims their technology or product is better. So that's why accessing this information is one thing, but you know, figuring out which one works best for us is very critical. So everybody has to invest some time. And this is where extension professionals can probably help, you know, discuss and you know evaluate your own program and see, oh, maybe this works best for in your situation. And having that conversation can be useful there. Yeah, definitely. It it can de- oh, it can definitely feel overwhelming <laughs> at times with there being so many options. One thing that you had mentioned as we were emailing is the idea that regulations can also contribute to IPM development and use. What exactly is the role of regulations? Is this going to apply mostly to those synthetics that some uh, conventional farms might be using, or is it even bigger than that, like food safety? That's actually a very important aspect of IPM. You may not see that regulations as, uh, you know, in, in my new IPM model, I did not specify regulations anywhere specifically, but they are there everywhere in every aspect because regulations can let you figure out what you can grow, when you can grow, and, you know, how, how much you grow, right? That itself could be part of a solution. You know, if, if you don't have a crop that a pest can attack, then pest doesn't have any food. So you, you see that regulation, that kind of regulation can help. Then when it comes to whether it is a fertilizers or biostimulants or pesticides, there is also these regulations help decide when to apply, how much to apply and how often and uh, everything related to their use. So regulations play a very important role not just for growing crops and spraying or applying certain things, but how much residue can be there. And, you know, you know they, they are good guidelines for us to effectively use our options we have. So they play a very critical role. That makes sense. So I didn't prep you for this because I'm just thinking of it now in the conversation. So I apologize. We'll see how this goes. But, okay, I'm curious. Let's say I'm a farmer. I'm maybe newer to this, so I'm less familiar with what's going to be a predictable pest in my field. And I see damage in my broccoli. What are some of the steps a farmer should be taking in this season to be thinking about next season? Like my first thought as a non-IPM professional or extension agent is to just be like taking notes and, and pictures, right? Because if you don't even know what it is, it seems like that's step one. But would you agree with that? And what kind of would be the steps that you would counsel a farmer if they're facing a new challenge in their, their field? Like not just for the immediate control, but for the long-term big picture of their farm going forward. I see. So so the question is not the, about seasonal pests, but if there is something new, right? Like if there is something new. Yeah. Or maybe the, maybe it is a seasonal pest, but it's their first year growing in this location, right? So maybe it's a pest that they just don't have knowledge about yet. Like how are people supposed to build up their knowledge base about such things? I, I think like there, there are, the, the first thing is to know what are common pests of that crop, pests and diseases, common issues. It is very important to know what are those, when they typically occur and how to identify or recognize them or what are the damage symptoms or infection symptoms and look at those periodically, like uh, existing literature or like these uh, pest management guidelines or crop production guides already provide a lot of information. That really helps based on the damaged leaf. Is it a leaf spot or is it like a a leaf is chewed or is is there a leaf minor or is the plant wilting? Based on those, we can we can have an idea what the pest is. And some of them, some of these guides already guidelines or pest management guidelines already have some strategies to prevent them, not just to detect, right? Prevent them, 
uh, and then you have to take control measures when the, once they are there. So I think accessing good resources and especially these um, production guides related to that region is very important because they, they may, you know, if, if, if you are looking at a guide some, in a, some other state, that may not be relevant to us. So that is the first step, getting familiar with the problems, anticipated problems and staying on top of that, which is not easy. I, that is why I really admire farmers because it's not an easy job. It's huge. Uh, it's easier to be a researcher than to be a farmer. <laughs> so I really appreciate all the far- what farmers do. Yeah, right. It's true. I mean, even just the example I threw out broccoli, there could be so many different things that would affect a broccoli planting. And those would be different depending on the time of year. And yeah, it's a, it's a definitely a complex game. Okay. So I often like to ask farmers who I have on as guests, what the best thing is that they've done for their farm. Since you're on the extension side, I want to spin this around. What do you think is the best thing that extension can offer to farmers today and how can they make best use of it? That's a a great question because, you know, our mission in extension is to provide practical solutions, science-based practical solutions. So the best thing we could do, anybody in extension could do, is to provide a practical solution. There are lots of options to control a pest or, you know, even when they are in developmental stages, there are numerous options and everything seems to be exciting and very effective. But the practical part in air quotes is is very important. If that is not practical, in terms of you know cost or you know the technology it re- requires to deliver or use and the longevity of that particular option everything it has to be something that grower can immediately use or grower can use it to save their crop and also it doesn't you know put a lot of economic burden sometimes even if it is a cheaper maybe the application requires special equipment or special uh, procedure that may not be practical so Providing practical solution is the best thing. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Is there anything else that you want to share with our listeners about your work or IPM? I I was referring to the IPM model uh, earlier. In 2019, I developed this uh, new IPM model based on my nearly 10 years of observations in California, working with small and large farmers and basically being out there, interacting with farmers, understanding their needs and what available solutions they have and challenges and opportunities, everything. Looking at all those, uh, I developed this new IPM paradigm that I published in 2019. It is not just about various control options. It is knowing the pest and managing information, integrating modern technology and the value of communication between extension and stakeholders and st- among stakeholders and between everybody and the public as you know consumers of the produce and everything so the new ipm model is something that i would like the, if, the your listeners to take a look at uh, it, yeah. it talks about not just pest management aspects but the social aspects of food production too Mm, can you talk about that a bit more too, the social aspects? Definitely. Food accessibility, affordability, you know, safety, we talk quite a bit. Like, you know, people generally talk about safety of the food in terms of, uh, you know, contamination or residues and, you know, contaminants or pesticide residues and so on. But affordability, not many people talk about it. Not all populations in, in any society can afford or they have access to healthy food. So integrated pest management not just talks about the new model I'm talking about, not just uh, about managing pests sustainably, but they have to, the system has to help farmer make money. The farmers have to be economically viable. And the food that we pro- the farmers produce should be socially acceptable. Acceptability is not just in terms of like, you know, okay, this is food I can accept. It is about, can I afford, can I purchase this? The equity, food-related equity, affordability and accessibility, those are also very important. And with AI, 
AI is has become very uh, you know more popular in the recent years, but the innovations, ag innovations, and modern technologies have been integrated into IPM for a long time. So that's what we need to focus on: producing food that is safe for everybody and that is affordable for everybody, and that makes farming a profitable enterprise for the farmers. So that's what IPM is about. Yeah, I love that social element. I know that Casey and I have often talked about that. I think it's John Eichard, who is an economist. I'm I'm going to apologize to the universe if I get all these details wrong. But I think he's where I got the idea that, you know, sustainability has many pillars, right? There's the ecological health, but there also has to be that financial health question that you brought up too. And we actually end up talking about this a lot on the podcast the co-host and I end up getting to it with almost every guest, especially people who have been farming for a couple of decades, is what features about farming have they been able to make sustainable so that they can keep doing it and providing food for their customers. And the financial part is a huge piece of that. So from what you're talking about, coming up with pest management solutions that actually work in the farm's budget. Is, is what that would look like, right? <laughs> exactly. That's what practical means. <laughs> practical solution means. Right. Maybe we could technically pay 100 people to go out and physically remove every... Yes. Oh, what's that little yellow every guy? Every, every little... worm and every yeah, weed, but that's, right? that's not a practical solution. So, right. So we're thinking about both on that big scale society level, like what you're doing, the bigger picture of many farms, but also on our own farm, what's the solution that's going to work on all these levels? I think those are really important thoughts for farmers to be thinking about. And this podcast is probably going to come out sometime this winter. So it's a really good time for people to maybe sit back and reflect on their season and what pest management strategies did and did not work. Where would you suggest they go if they want to add a few new tools to their toolbox, like would they just go to their local extension office or their local extensions website? And are there also any great books you would recommend or is all most of this information so regional that they really should just be starting with their most local extension? All of those uh, choices you mentioned work. They, rather than reading books, I think, you know, look, looking at the go, going to the university websites and also contacting extension faculty as well as researchers at our research centers. Uh, there are different research centers throughout the state. They can contact researchers or extension professionals at those centers and locations and find information. We have uh, several university publications and there are also some open access journals. Some literature is available for free from open access journals. Those things can help too. I also suggest talking to Ag Input Industry. They also provide information about certain pests and because they, they have focused research on certain pests and diseases, so they can also help them. You don't have to buy or get, you know, information. I mean, like you don't have to buy product or anything from anybody, but at least information should be freely available Mm -hmm. um, from various sources. Okay. Well, hopefully farmers out there will do some of that reading and researching, reflecting on last year's challenges so that they can go into this next season with some extra tools in their tool belt. So when it's July and it's hot and suddenly they're facing a challenge and a key crop. Maybe they have some strategies already ready to go. Yeah. That's probably the the key. I know that in the winter I've always been like, oh, I just need to relax. But that is really an important time for us farmers to be working on our education. Okay. I have to ask one more question if it's okay. I did see at one point when researching that you also have done some stand-up comedy on the side of all your other work, which is not a super common side hobby or pursuit. I'm curious if you can just tell us briefly how that came about and if it's a skill that ever translates into your extension work at all or gets applied. Definitely. I, I think it was uh, published only in one place, and I'm, I'm surprised that you noticed and remember that. I think it was uh, when 
I joined OSU. It's an unusual. Yes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> when when I uh, traveled, as I traveled around the world and saw different you know, societies and what what they do and how they live and you know their happiness levels and so on. I realized that, you know, happiness is within us. Everybody has the control. It is not easy, but we are finally responsible for our happiness. So in 2008, I started, you can call it a campaign or an organization. I started something called Laugh to Live to start giving talks and organize workshops about finding happiness. So that's how I started in 2008. But in this, in that process, I realized that people, you know, they like more about, they like humor about serious things than serious conversation about humor or happiness, right? So I realized that people just like general humor. They don't want to hear serious message about happiness. So as a spin-off, I started this stand-up comedy to small groups or large groups. Like, I obviously, I don't advertise and just, you know, people word of mouth kind of thing to different groups in California and other places. So how it helped me, it definitely helped me. I I naturally have this sense of humor since my childhood. Then I realized that, you know, after thinking about this laugh to live and then having some stand-up comedy, I realized that a very serious message can be conveyed with good humor. So that really helped as I give talks to uh, my stakeholders in you know all all my in all my presentations, I don't plan for that. If it naturally comes, it comes, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. But the most common feedback I get from listeners of or the you know the attendees of my talks is that it is very informative and also very entertaining. Usually, people might say, "Oh, it's very informative. I enjoyed your talk," but they also say, "Oh, it's really funny," and then you know it is very entertaining. I started to realize the value of conveying that message in a, in a positive way. There is so much chaos in life and humor is the best medicine. Laughter is the best medicine. So bringing a few smiles wherever we are is, is a good thing. Uh, so I effectively use in my communication, maybe not always, right? Like, you know, some conversation requires seriousness. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> some, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you have to read the room, I suppose. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I I use it effectively. It, it is it benefits mutually. Yeah, it makes me feel better, and it it conveys the message well, and uh, my audiences also appreciate that. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I agree with you that sometimes, when used appropriately, humor can help us get through harder topics or hard things. And you were saying chaos is a part of life. Chaos is also a part of farming. So (laughs) maybe maybe in addition to going on extension websites and looking up about pests, farmers this winter should also watch some really funny movies (laughs) and and find a way to get some levity into their lives too. Well, thank you so much, Surendra. Where can people find you specifically if they want to learn more? Will I think you inc- already sent me the links for a lot of different resources, and we'll include all those in the show notes. But just on air, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want? Is it via a website or? Yes, I think my website, and then I also if if they Google my name and a specific topic, if they. IPM or biologicals or microbial control. I try to put a lot of information on open access sources so they can freely see those. There are YouTube videos about various presentations and there are several articles online. The links I shared with you can be shared and Googling also helps. Okay, great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I think this was perfectly timed information for the winter study season and Yeah, we may have to call you again about some more specifics at some point, but I really enjoyed hearing more and I really appreciate you sharing your time with us, Surendra. Thank you very much, Katie. I really enjoyed this conversation and and thank you not just for having me, but for farming, producing, being a farmer. It is our responsibility to thank you and all the farmers for all the hard work you do and, you know, producing food for us. Thank you. Yeah, agreed. I agreed. Thank you to all the farmers out there. You guys all rock. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Growing for Market podcast. 
If you've been enjoying the show, please consider giving us a follow and a rating or review. It really helps others find the podcast. For more tips and tricks from farmer to farmer, check out our magazine at growingformarket.com. Whether you're a commercial grower or just want to grow like one, subscribe to Growing for Market magazine for the nitty gritty of growing, marketing, and the business of market farming. We publish 10 issues per year with articles written by experienced farmers on topics ranging from tools and techniques to farm business operations and marketing. If you've been listening to the Growing for Market podcast and haven't yet checked out Growing for Market magazine, we've made a change so you can now try the magazine for free. We've added a free month to the beginning of all first-time subscriptions. Try out the digital or paper magazine subscription for a month. And if it's not for you, cancel within 28 days and you'll never get billed. Even the most basic subscription gets you a year of the magazine, plus 150 back issues from the last 15 years. Digital subscriptions start at just $30 per year. So head on over to growingformarket.com and subscribe today to benefit from over three decades of writing by farmers for farmers in Growing for Market magazine.